suddenly a Dalek walks into my classroom. So there's this hunter, and he wants to shoot a monkey for some reason. Welcome to this week's lesson. This time we're going to look at the electric field strength as part of the electromagnetism topic of the Advanced Tower Physics course. You might already be familiar with some of these diagrams, such as this dipole here from maybe National Five or higher, but it gets a bit extended and includes things like the electric field being zero inside um, conductors. So let's get started. The first thing to talk about is the idea of not just an electric field, but a field in general. You see, a field is a different way of thinking about our equations. In terms of the gravity, you might say that Newton's universal rule of gravity tells you how to calculate the force between any two masses in the whole wide universe, and that's all you need to know. But thinking in terms of fields, it's maybe a bit more useful, because it's not so interesting to find the particular size, because what we're trying to do is see how the objects are going to move around in space over time. So instead of saying that there's a force between two points, we would say that planet Earth would set up a gravity field around it, and any other masses that come near it would feel that force and be drawn towards Earth as a result. In a similar way, we're going to say that an electric field is a region of space where a charged particle will experience a force that's caused by another charge. The electric field strength is similar or analogous to little g. It's the value of the field at a particular point. So every single point in space has a value of this, and it's defined as being the force exerted on a unit positive charge. What that means is you imagine that a charge somewhere has set up a big old electric field, and then every single point around it has a strength of electric field associated with it. That is illustrated quite nicely in this piece of software. There's two I'll be referring to here. This one is from FET Colorado. It's the charges and field software. And the second is focus on physics, fields, and just fields. So this first one is quite nice. If we say there is a positive charge somewhere and we place it into the universe, well, what it shows is that every other point around that is now affected. Even if it's just empty space, we say that the electric field is still there. This charge has changed the nature of the space around it. But we don't actually notice it until a second charge comes along. So if you then place a second charge, a tiny little one, you can ask what would happen to it. Now, if I place it about here, the direction of the electric field in the background tells you what's going to happen, it's going to get pushed away. So that's the idea. Now we could have decided to talk about how the field affects a negative charge, but we've chosen, sort of universally around the world, to insist on talking about how it affects positive ones. There isn't really much significance to that choice, but it does matter that you are saying that in your answers as well. So it's part of the definition, it could have went one way or the other, it's a bit like how we could have described the North Pole as being the north and south poles of the planet, we could have swapped them around if we wanted, but we've chosen it this way, and it's important that you keep track on it. So conceptually the idea is that the one charge affects all the space around it, setting up this electric field, but no one notices it, no, no one sees it until you bring a second charge nearby. Only when you have a second charge is there something that feels that field, and then you see it get moved away as a result. There is a bit of a problem then, because to notice a field, or to measure it, you are required to bring a little charge into it. And we've just said that every single charge will set up its own electric field. So by bringing this second charge in, you're actually distorting the electric field around about it. And that's a bit inconvenient. We sort of work around this problem by presuming that our little charge, our unit test charge, is really, really, really small, at least compared to the other one we're measuring. In physics terms, you can never have that be zero, but you can have it be as close to zero as you like. So for our mathematical formulation of the problem, we can assume it's infinitely close to zero, and therefore it's effectively zero in terms of its effect on distorting the field around it. In practical terms, you can't really get away with that. The little probes that we use, they do have some limit. They do have an impact on the field around them. And the result of that is that you can only measure fields of a particular size. If you have a very strong field set up, then the probe will only have a small influence, so you're mainly measuring the background. Whereas if you're trying to measure the electric field around, say, a single electron or something tiny, then it basically doesn't work your device is more influential in the field than the thing you're trying to measure, so you pretty much get nonsense measurements. This is one of the things that determines the limits. Now you can see if I place my charge at any distance around it, the whole field is symmetric, and the closer I go, the stronger this arrow is going to be, or the longer it's going to be, indicating that the field is stronger. This animation also shows this in terms of the brightness of the background. I can also add on voltage here. This is a red voltage for a positive value. And I could, if I wanted to, add a grid and even the specific values, but that's not so important. But in terms of what this is as a definition, we've just said it's the force per unit charge. 
And as an equation, we can write that here. E, the electric field strength, measured in newtons per coulomb, is the total force divided by the charge. And as I said before, this is sort of equivalent to little g in gravity. Now, as the force is a vector, and the electric field depends upon that, it too is a vector. The nice thing about that is if you have multiple charges, say, you can work out the electric field caused by each of them at a particular distance, and then you just add them together in the usual vector way. That's quite handy. Similar to Coulomb's law, it means if you're dealing with multiple charges, you don't have to have fundamentally new physics, it's just the same multiple times, and then you add them all together. The other thing worth pointing out is that if I have a negative charge, well, it will also set up an electric field in the whole area. The only difference is those field lines will point towards it. And if you have a pair of them together, you can spot the pattern that was on the first slide in that the positive charge creates the field lines, if you like, and then they end on the negative charges nearby. Obviously, there's an edge effect here where you have to have some kind of approximation, but that's how we usually do it. I can show you this in a similar way in this other software, and it acts in a slightly simpler manner in that it shows field lines emanating out from the center. This is more closely linked to what we typically draw on paper. So we might draw a positive charge as doing this, whereas a negative charge would have the same, but all the lines point towards or in the way. It's quite important when you draw these diagrams that you get the direction of the arrows correct. It's one of the things you're marked upon. Anyway, back to our notes. So if you were to formalize it as an equation to calculate the value at any one given point in the space here, well, it's quite easy. You just do exactly what we were describing. We say the electric field is going to be equal to the force per charge, or force per coulomb. We also know Coulomb's law from before that allows us to work out the force between any two charges. And in order to get to the equation we want, I'm going to change the label slightly. So for a unit charge, then we have the secondary charge that comes in, this little wee one here. It's going to be defined as being very, very small. So we're going to give it the symbol little q for little charge. And then once we've distinguished that, we don't need this number one and two anymore. So we're saying the charge that sets up the field, this big red one here, that's just going to be q. So Coulomb's law says this here. And what we're trying to get to is not force, but force per charge. So we're going to divide both sides here by charge. In this case, we move the little q over to the left-hand side. So we divide both sides, cancels here, and we get force over charge on the left. Now we said before that force over charge, well, that's the same as the electric field. So we can replace f over q with e, and that gives us this equation in box. It tells us that the electric field at any given point around a charge is going to be dependent on the charge, multiplied by the constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and it's going to depend upon the separation squared. So it's an inverse square law similar to Coulomb's law. Now this kind of makes sense. I mean, if the electric field is how much force per charge, and we know the force depends upon the inverse of radius squared, it makes sense that the electric field will do that as well. But studying the nature of this equation, like any inverse square law, tells you some predictions. It tells you that very, very close to a charge, it's going to have a big impact. And then as you move further and further away from it, the influence of that charge is going to decay very quickly because of that inverse square. Um, for example, you can maybe see that in my simulation here. If I have a plus, uh, sorry, minus one charge over here to the right, and then I say I'm going to add on a much bigger positive charge sorry, on the left here, we well, might say that only the big one really matters, only the big one's important. But it turns out that round about the big one, it's obviously the most important thing, but near the smaller one, it has the dominant effect. So around the back here, it almost looks as if the field lines are barely affected by this big red one. And you'll see that when I delete it. Near it, it's kind of like this star diagram, which is what we had at the start. So even if there are big sort of charges around, the little ones still have an important influence. It's just local to them. Next to them, they're the most important thing. To give you an idea of some of the questions you might be asked, here's a couple of examples. The first one says that the dome of a Van de Graaff generator has a diameter of 400 millimeters. We are asked to work out what charge must be placed on the dome if the electric field on the surface needs to be a particular value. So 2.56 times 10 to the power of 5 newtons per coulomb. And we're also told it's pointing away from the dome. Now this pointing away bit, that has some significance. Because if we had a negative charge on the dome, all the field lines would point towards it. What we're talking about is not a negative charge, but a positive one. So we know that on the dome, we're talking about an excess positive charge. So overall, however the machine works, it must remove electrons from that dome surface. That's part of what we need to know. So in our question, before we've even started, we've figured out we're talking about a positive charge. The equation is then going to help us work out the size of it, how many coulombs. And if you really wanted to, you could then work out how many electrons. 
a slightly subtle point to note here is we have to think about how we're modeling this. So if you have a sphere surface, then the charges are going to be spread evenly across it because if, well, they're all going to push each other away from each other and they're going to try and spread out as evenly as possible. Our equation doesn't quite work for that though. It doesn't take into account the distribution of the charges in three-dimensional space. That's quite a tricky thing to deal with. But if you're reasonably far away from it, that trickiness approximates quite nicely to just the usual thing we talk about, which is one charge at the centre, and it's just one big charge, and we're only interested in being slightly further away. So we're going to treat in this question, we're going to simplify and assume that a sphere with charges on the surface is the same as the same amount of charge all sitting at the centre as a tiny little volume. It's a bit of an approximation, but it's all we can really do. Now you might ask, well, how far away is the surface from the center? It's not the diameter, it's not 400. It's going to be half of that, it's going to be the radius, which is 400 millimeters or 0.4 meters over two, so 0 0.2 meters. That's the value we need to put into this equation. It's quite common for people to make mistakes with the units or indeed to forget to square it. The value we're given in the question, it says the E field at the dome surface has to be this. And then people tend to be quite bad at guessing which value it is. Is this a force? Is it a charge? Is it an electric field? Is it a potential? The units are one clue, and it is also specified in the question. But this one here is the electric field value. So we have E and we have R, so we're going to use both of them to find Q. Now I've chosen to break from the usual higher tradition of writing the equation, substituting numbers, and then rearranging. And I've chosen to rearrange first. At an advanced higher level, it can sometimes be helpful, particularly if you're going to use an equation multiple times for multiple parts in a question, to do all the algebra once in terms of symbols, and then for each particular part you just put in the values you're using. To be honest here though, I just did it out of habit. But in any case, you have an equation in terms of Q, you substitute in the values, don't forget the square, and then you work out the final sum. It turns out to be 1.14 microcoulombs. Do note, I've made a bit of a lazy mistake here. I've approximated 4 pi epsilon naught as being 9 to the 9. It is better practice for you to actually put the value of, of epsilon naught in here, because if there are any mistakes, doing the proper substitution will allow you to earn the mark for that before committing to the rest. And particularly 9 to the 9, sometimes there are errors in the third decimal place, or the third significant figure, which can affect your final answer. And the markers are not very sympathetic to people who choose to be lazy. It's a bit of a shame, though, because it is a bit of a mouthful. For part B, we're told that a polystyrene sphere is painted with silver paint, it has a mass of 0 0.08 grams, a charge of 4.80 nanocoulombs, and it's placed on there or near there, and then we're told it will sit above the dome and sit at rest. We want to ask the question, how big is that distance? How far away is it? With the diagram, it's usually quite obvious what's going on. As soon as you have a diagram, you can then draw on the free body forces, and that tells you how to work it out. Any object that exists has a weight sitting here on Earth. And if this thing is going to hover, something has to be opposing that weight. Something has to be balancing it. And obviously, in the context here, that's going to be the force caused by the electric field on the Van der Graaff dome. And that's the start of our solution. Many pupils really puzzle over this when I ask them in class, and they really struggle to find the solution, typically because they don't start drawing. As soon as I give them the diagram, it then typically falls into place. The other thing that students tend to avoid is starting with a statement like this. This is quite a key piece of working, and it's actually the key bit of thinking as well. Once you know it, then sure, it's obvious you don't really need it, but it's very helpful to write it down. What I'm saying is at rest, the downwards weight equals the upwards electric field force. I can then substitute in for each of them, weight is equal to m times g, and then the electric field force is equal to what's Coulomb's law, really, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, multiplied by the charge on the sphere, times the charge on the dome from part A, and then this r value is the separation. We have a whole chain of numbers here. I, for whatever reason in the past when I made these notes, chose to rearrange this and then put it all into my calculator. I can't really recommend this. Rearranging with algebra has some advantages. Calculating all the values and then rearranging has other advantages. What I've got here is a bit of a mismatch of both of them, and that's not very helpful. The reason I don't like this isn't that it doesn't work just the same. It's because you have so many subscripts and powers and multiplications and squares and so on that you're almost bound to introduce an error when you start running out of paper. Here this works, but that's only because I've given it the space it sort of needs. In any case, we end up with a value of 0 0.250 meters. And this might sound a bit strange. Something hovering 25 centimeters above the Van der Graaff dome does seem a bit unlikely. Certainly whenever I've played with these things, you're not going to get that effect. But actually, there's a bit of an explanation. And I should have a final line of my work in here. 
See, this is the distance, not from the surface, but from the centre of the dome where we've modelled all our charge being. The separation between little q and the centre is 250 millimetres. But the dome itself before was 200. So this actual separation here is just 50 millimetres or 5 centimetres. This question wouldn't get the final mark without that statement. The other type of question you're often likely to see might look something like examples number two and three. In these questions you have not one charge but a pair of them. This is quite similar to the questions from last week in Coulomb's law. And I can actually model it a little bit with my software. So to give you an idea, what we have is uh, four coulombs of charge, four microcoulombs, and then 10 centimetres away, which I'm going to model with 10 boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. we have another charge. But it's not going to be five, but six. So I need to add an extra one in here separately, because the software has limits. And then what we are asked is, how big is the electric field at this point x, which is six centimetres along from A and four from B. It's not in the middle. Now, if you were given two charges that were equal, and if we were talking about the midpoint, then sure, that would be a point where these two fields are going to cancel each other out. Because B is positive, it's going to push the unit charges that you place in there, it's going to push them away, and A is going to do the same. So both of these are going to push in towards the middle, and so they're going to fight with each other. They're going to press against each other, as it were. If I place my little test charge in here, it's going to experience a force from both of them. And I can represent that one this way as well. So you can see the charge on the right pushes it away in all directions, and the charge on the left does the same. But in the middle, well, they're kind of opposing each other. And there's actually a little space where there's overall no electric field. This is one thing you're commonly asked to find, and indeed question 3 has exactly that. But you're not always asked for it. One mistake pupils often make is they just presume that's what the question's asking. You can have any value in between here. If you're a little bit off, it can be all sorts of different sizes. And you could, at least in principle, be asked for any of those locations. How we're going to work this out is quite straightforward. We're going to take the influence of A on X, deal with that over here, and then we're going to take the influence of B on X and deal with it separately over there. Finally, you just add the two together. This is a lovely property of all vectors. You can always just work out the individual parts and add them up at the end. This makes life a lot simpler than you might expect it to be. My top tip for all students is just to avoid feeling overwhelmed. Just break it down into the pieces of physics that you do know. There aren't that many of them. So almost any situation that might be strange and unusual is always going to boil back down to some of these examples I'm giving you. Uh, before we get stuck into all this, one of the other top tips is, again, to have your diagram to make sure you've read the question, and then B, annotate it. So here I've shown the direction of the electric field from B on X, and shown here the electric field from A on X, and we can see that they are opposing each other. You might say that since A is the bigger one, it's going to have the dominant effect. That's true. It has a bigger charge, therefore it's going to be greater. But the distance is also a bit bigger. So actually, it's going to have a smaller influence. And to work out, or to guess the value at x, is it positive or negative, it kind of depends on which of these effects is most important. Because we have a symmetry in the numbers here, we can actually look at that in detail. Um, charge A is one and a half times as big, so at the same distance, it would be one and a half times as strong. This distance here is one and a half times the distance from B. Now, if you were taking a naive approach, you might assume these effects cancel, but it doesn't here because of the square on R, and it actually becomes the case that this effect dominates, and A is actually the weaker of the two fields at this position. But in any case, um, you don't have to predict everything. You can just take the equation, substitute in the numbers, and work out the final answer. Do that for both of them. We know this one is pointing to the right, this one is pointing to the left. After that, you need to combine the two together. It doesn't matter how you add them, but just end up with positive numbers, for me at least, I would always take the large one and then subtract the smaller of the two. So I know these fields are fighting with each other, Big one, take away, small one, gives me the overall result. And then using my diagram and these numbers, I think about which one's going to win. 15 to the right and 22 to the left. Well, the left force is going to win, or the left electric field. So that's my overall direction. Um, I should note, as I said before, there is a sort of point right in the middle here where it has a zero value. Because these two charges kind of, this one pushes that way, this one pushes that way. And if you are anywhere along this line, you're going to get pushed towards this balance point, this equilibrium where the impact of both of these forces, or both of these fields rather, is going to be equal. But this is actually an unstable equilibrium line. You see, if you're sitting at this point perfectly on there, then sure, you're fine, you'll stay there. You're not going to move left or right. 
But if you get nudged by a little bit of thermal vibration or just the size of the object itself, if you're just a tiny bit up above this line or a tiny bit below this line, then there's going to be a component of the electric field that pushes you out. In this case shown here, it's pushing up slightly. And then a second or two later, that's going to mean you move up more, and now the electric field gets stronger, so you move even faster. And long story short, if you're very close but not exactly on this line, you're always going to end up getting shoved out. So in real practical terms, you'll never actually find any charges on here. It's a bit like finding a huge boulder balanced very, very precisely on the very, very tip of a pointy mountain. Sure, it's possible it could exist there if you could get it there, but it's not going to happen in nature, and it's not going to hang about for very long. In example number three, we have a positive 25 nanocoulomb charge and a, a negative 2 nanocoulomb charge, a very big one and a very small one. And they're separated by 120 millimeters, or 12 centimeters. This time we are asked for the slightly more predictable style, which is to figure out where in the whole space the sum of the two electric fields is going to be zero, or it just says find the position of the zero electric field. The emphasis on the here tells us that there's only one, and that can be really quite useful. Some tips for approaching this type of thing. Um, you kind of need to avoid getting stuck into what equation am I going to use and how I'm going to solve it all. That's all important and right now today that's the new bit so you'll need practice on that. But in terms of tackling the overall problems you have to first think big picture. And to indicate what I mean by that I'm going to simulate this question here with 25 units of charge at this position and then I'm going to introduce negative 2 units of charge 12 boxes away. Now this simulation gives us the answer, it's going to be over here, over to the left, same as my notes did. That's a bit of a spoiler. But imagine we didn't realise that. You'd have to sort of go through the regions around it and try and rule out places where the electric field can never be zero. Now first off, anywhere to the right of the big charge is definitely not going to be zero, because what we're looking for are places where the two fields are equal in size and fighting each other. Now if you're nearest to the big charge, i.e. anywhere in the right half of the page here, then the biggest charge is going to be the biggest and it's going to win. The overall influence here is that the negative charge is barely noticeable. It has no influence at all. Um, likewise, near the regions above it and below it, we have a similar effect. You're closest to the big charge and it will dominate. It's going to go away. The common presumption is that it's going to be somewhere in the middle because many questions look like that. But here that doesn't work. You see, the big positive charge is going to push all of our unit positive charges away. So the direction is going to be in the middle here, towards the left. And that's what you see in the simulation. And if you now look at the negative charge, well, its role is going to be to pull positive charges in towards it. So in the middle region, if I place a little charge here, say, it will get pulled towards the left because of A. So in between A and B, both of the charges actually work together. Both of them shove to the left. And then if you look at the above the line situation, well, charge B might try and shove them away, but as soon as the unit charge gets far enough away from B, well, A is going to sort of grab onto it. As soon as you get closer to A than you are at B, the negative charge will pull it back in. So there's this whole zone around A, and in between B and A, where, where you end up is landing on A. That's because any charge placed there eventually ends up close enough to A to get pulled in. And this kind of rules out everything to the right of B and everything in the middle. The only place where you can have the charges that are, sorry, the electric fields oppose each other is to the left of charge A, in this zone. You see here, B is trying to push them away, and A is trying to pull them back. So A is pulling to the right, B is pushing to the left, so they're opposing each other. Also, in this area, you can be a lot closer to A than you are to B. So if you're close to the small charge, that makes up for the fact that the big charge is much bigger. And that's the sort of idea. So our prediction would be we're going to be somewhere in this area, and it's going to be relatively close to A. It's not going to be something like 10 meters away. Because as you get further and further away, well, you're pretty much as far away from A as you are B, but B is tw uh, 12 and a half times bigger, so B would win. So there's only really a little zone around about this charge A where it has a big enough influence to balance out B. Formalizing the work in here, we're going to say for the overall electric field to be zero, we want electric field A to be equal in size to electric field B. We're then going to use the electric field equation from before and substitute that once for charge A at distance RA, and charge B at distance RB. So that's the two halves here. The same symbols, but different subscripts.
we can then be a little bit clever. We can say that the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is going to cancel out on both sides. And then we can also rearrange a little bit in order to get a flat equation here. And finally, we can substitute in the values of the charges. Charge A was equal to 2 nanocoulombs, B was equal to 25 nanocoulombs. I've saved us a bit of grief here by just dropping the nanocoulombs because they appear on both sides of the equation. So it's going to be a common factor here. That means we don't have to bother with it. There is a bit of a problem from this point, though. We have an equation with two unknown values, and we can't solve that. It's always impossible, unless you know something else about the situation. And this is a very common thing to come across at advanced higher level. You'll know something, and you'll process the working to a certain point, and then you'll get stuck with two unknowns. That's why I've included this example. Whenever you have this situation, the answer is going to be simultaneous equations from National 5 Maths. And you can end up sometimes where you have two complex ones where you're solving them with the various methods that they used. But here, almost always in physics, the substitution method is going to work just fine. And it happens to be the simplest. In our question here at the start, we had the value of the separation, which was 120. And I separately introduced myself these two distance labels. Ra is this size and Rb is this bigger one. Now the reason I drew that on this diagram is for this line of working here. If I was doing this in an exam, I would be drawing this diagram just as a matter of cause. I always draw my diagram. And that way, when it comes time to figuring out what's going on, I have a fighting chance of doing it. I make sure I copy the right data from the question, and I have it set up to keep me right. I only have to look up the page rather than back to my question paper. And here you can hopefully visually see that the value of Rb is going to be the separation plus the value of Ra, whatever that might be. Now, I don't know Ra, but I do know how these two link together. Rb equals 0 0.12 plus Ra. And this allows me, in the equation just down here, to replace Rb with number plus Ra. That doesn't completely solve it, but it doesn't turn an equation from having two unknowns into having just one, and that is a good starting point. I should say in the previous line, I took the square root of both sides in order to simplify things. From this line on, it's really quite straightforward. It's just basic math, really. We apply the two pi to uh, the root two, sorry, to both the values inside, and then we do a subtraction. Five ra take away root two ra um, is basically three point five nine ra's, and then you divide both sides by three point five nine, and finally solve. The answer turns out to be zero point zero four seven meters. Quite often, people stop there though, and that costs them marks. Again, remember, the electric field is a vector. It requires a direction. And any time you have a direction, you also kind of need to define an origin. We know it's in this location here, but you could talk about it being defined from B over to there, but it makes more sense to probably talk about from A. So you need to specify that. Working backwards, I'm starting at A, I'm going to the left, and I go by 0 0.047 meters. That size there. That's the position where the electric fields are equal to zero. There are several other examples you might come across. Um, this one here has three of them. No, oh, my mistake. There are two charges, and we're asked for the size of the electric field at a slightly unusual location. We're given this triangle shape, the dimensions of it, and the size of the two charges. And what we need to work out is the overall field here. Just like before, what we're going to do is work out these two things separately. We're going to work out how big the field from A is on X, and how big the field from B is on X. And then we're going to use vector work to add them together. In terms of working out the two fields, it's just the same as before, quite straightforward, nothing new there. We don't care about the separation between the two of them, and that all works out just fine. The tricky bit here, I suppose, would be the vector issue. So we have the two sizes, and we can also work out the two directions. Because B is a negative charge, the field is going to get pulled towards it. Because A is a positive charge, well, the field line is going to push away from it. It gives us our two sizes. And I can sketch on roughly on my diagram the resultant that I'm going to get. But I now need to calculate the size of that resultant. Maybe that's straightforward. You do the tip to tail thing with Pythagoras and you work out a value. Here it's 49.5 newtons per coulomb. And then you've also got to do the last bit, which is working out the size of the angle. Here again, we're taking this vector, moving it over so it's tip to tail, and then using the tan function. You could also have used the cosine rule, I suppose. Um, the final complication is figuring out how to state the angle. Bearings can work, but you really need a compass rose, and since you don't have anything measuring from vertical or north anyway, it's a bit tricky here. So what I'm saying is the electric field at x is equal to the number at an angle of 37.3 degrees anti-clockwise from the ax line. So that's this line here, and I'm going to go anti-clockwise, which is measured up that way. In order to specify an angle, you have to have a line to start with, 
and then you either go clockwise or anti-clockwise and then you have the number. It's a bit of a mouthful to say but hopefully that makes sense. Example 5 has a pair of spheres now and there's a bit of symmetry in this problem. You have two metallic metallicized, that means spray painted presumably, or coated in tinfoil spheres with a mass of 0 0.2 grams. They're both hung on threads, they're half a meter from the mounting point, and they are initially touching and uncharged, so they'll hang straight down. We then charge them up. Once they're charged, they will both have the same charge, and they will therefore repel each other. And you end up with this situation here. We are told the size of the separation between them, and it turns out that's enough to work out the charge on each sphere. This is quite clever if you think about it, you take any two random spheres and all you really need to know are some things you can measure with your ruler and the mass of them. And from that you can measure or at least work out the charge. That's quite clever. This is going to be an example of simultaneous equations which is a little bit more complex. So first, before we get stuck into working, we need to try and arrange things into a familiar way. We have to work out the different forces that are playing here. We take this diagram, note the symmetry, and always, if you have a symmetry, it's usually a good idea to split it in half. So we have this angle here from the centre line, and we know the hypotenuse is 0 0.5 metres long, and the separation along the bottom is going to be half of 100 millimetres, which is 50 millimetres, or 0 0.05. That's one thing we know. We also know that the electric field force is going to be along the line between them, that's the horizontal line, and the weight is going to be vertically down. These are the two forces that pull on that thread, and together they're going to pull in this direction indicated here, parallel to the thread. The reason the the ball isn't going in that direction is because the thread is going to pull back. There's going to be a tension in that thread which is going to balance out those combined forces. This bit I've had in the past um, some very good students tell me things like they're happy with all the concepts but they really don't understand tension as a separate thing. Tension really isn't a separate thing here, it's just really the observation that things are overall balanced so you can work out the missing piece. Once we've got that we then need to introduce two other parts and that's why we need this triangle. We're going to say that the combined tension along the line of the thread can be split into two pieces. And those pieces are going to depend on the size of this angle. There's going to be a horizontal component to the tension and a vertical component. And we can work out each of them using the usual thing from um, higher, where we take cosine of the angle is opposite over hypotenuse, or adjacent over hypotenuse, rearrange it all, and the vertical component of the tension will equal the total tension times cosine of the angle, and likewise for the horizontal part. We then have two forces acting in the horizontal direction. The electric field pushes us to the right, and the component of the tension pulls us back to the left. Those two are going to be equal in size. In the vertical case, we have the vertical component of the tension opposed by the weight pulling it down. And this is going to formulate the start of our calculation. So you'll always pretty much have um, forces in equilibrium if you can build a thing and look at it. That's kind of a requirement for you to look at it, because otherwise it would change all the time. So this statement here says, at equilibrium, all the forces are balanced in both dimensions. Horizontally and vertically, we can analyze the situation as I've just described, and then you can work out an equation. What I'm saying here is that the force due to the electric field is equal to the equation from before, one over 4 pi epsilon naught times the charge over r, and in this case, we have it being equal to the component of the tension. You might ask, why is q squared? Well, this is because it depends upon the charge on both spheres. So this is Coulomb's law, really. And if both spheres have the same charge, well, it's q1 times q1, really, which means q squared is just a bit simpler. In the vertical case, I also know the weight. It's equal to mg. And that allows me to have two separate equations. Now, both of these are going to depend upon theta. That's going to be my link. They also depend upon t, I suppose, but I can't measure t. Um, and finally, there is only going to be one unknown left. It's going to be this value of q, because I know the value of r, I know the value of m, I know the value of g. This next step can often be confusing. What I'm saying is I'm going to divide equation 1 by equation 2. So on the left half you can see here it's the left half of equation 1 divided by the left half of equation 2. And then on the right what we have is the right half of equation 1, that's kind of that bit, and then divided by mg. Sometimes people really struggle to see why this is allowed, why that's okay. Well, you can think of it if you like, as two steps. You can say, take this equation and divide both sides by t cosine theta. And that's all fine, and you get this lot, but instead of mg, it would be t cosine theta. And after that, you just say, well, I know that t cosine theta equals mg, and you can swap it out. An equal sign means these two things are equivalent to each other, they're the same. So when I divide this equation by 
t cosine theta on one side and then mg on the other, I am doing the same to both sides of the equation because those two things are equivalent. To deal with the fact that we have two thetas, and well, well first of all, the two t's are going to cancel, um, that gets rid of those, and then we have two thetas, and you might want to merge them. That tends to make things a lot easier. What I'm going to use is the trig identity. Um, sine theta over cosine theta will be tan of theta, and that it reduces down the complexity here. And next, I'm going to substitute in all the values that I know. Do not hear that the value of r is the full um, 0 0.1 meters, not this half value that we had there. Um, we're still two, we still have two unknowns, theta and um, q here. What we need to work out is the value of this angle. We could have done that at the start, we didn't, but we could. We could take the hypotenuse value and the opposite and work it out. There's a bit of a simplification in here, I'm saying, for small angles, particularly in radians, that tan theta is pretty much the same as sine of theta, which is pretty much this value, which is 0 0.1. Um, and then I've swapped tan theta for 0 0.1. But if you really wanted it to be more exact, you could do this um, with um, here to work out the value of theta using the sine function, and then substitute it into the tan value. A little note on the algebra, I suppose, here. I'm saying tan theta is equal to 0 0.1, and there's another 0 0.1 squared here. So when that comes up, I end up with 0 0.1 cubed. And you have to just be able to process quite a lot of algebra, really. And then you do all the sums, you get this value, that would be for q squared, so you need to square root it, and you find 14.8 nanocoulombs is the value. That's quite a tricky question. Um, consider that long-term training for really quite difficult problem solving. It is something that will come up in other units as well, this style of analysis, so it's worth studying in this context. It's mainly in the rotational unit, to be honest, though. The next part of the course is charging a conducting sphere by induction. You'll be familiar with uh, charging an insulating rod with a duster from earlier parts of your scientific studies. Here we have a negative one, but the same process works for a positive charge too. So we have our conducting sphere on an insulated base that just allows us to handle it without affecting it. And then when we bring in this negatively charged rod, it will cause all of the other charges on the surface of the sphere to move around. You see, these negative charges have created an electric field, and when that gets placed close to the surface here, the electrons on the surface feel that electrostatic repulsion, and then they will move away. If you ground the rod by touching it, those charges will actually move into you. They'll move down through your finger, through the floor, and off the ground. You then stop touching it, and then you have diagram number three. This is clever because you're able to control whether or not they're earth just by touching it, and it only takes a moment. Now if you remove the rod, well, the charges can rearrange themselves to be evenly spread, but they cannot get um, access to more electrons. You see, you've cut off where they went, so this, this makes the effect permanent. You can see this effect happening live in this little video GIF. So you rub the surface to make it charged up, you bring the conductor in by holding the handle, ground it, and then you can pick it up and transfer some charges onto one of these spheres. There are some other things you need to be able to do though. Um, so far we don't have quite enough to do Coulomb's experiment. What we need to be able to do is add charges to both spheres. And one way to do that is, well, you have one of them, and then you bring a second identical one in and just momentarily touch the two together. If you do that, they will end up having half the charge each and it will be exactly evenly spread out, assuming they are precisely the same size. The same effect allows you to control how much you have on each one. If you start off with a big charge on it, you can then half it and half it and half it again as many times as you like. Notice we can't measure how many we have, but it is quite handy all the same. You can show that by halving the charge on either sphere, you get half the deflection and therefore have half the force. That's all called Coulomb needed. You can also do the same experiment, but with equal and opposite charges. If you start off with a pair that are touching, when you bring the electrostatic rod in, it will cause the electrons to move from one onto the other. You don't need to ground this time. Here, all you do is separate the two by moving them apart, and then when you re remove the rod, once again, the negative charges cannot get back to cancel out the positive ones because you've no longer got them linked. Many people find this topic to be quite confusing. I highly recommend this video here. It's from Delta Step on YouTube, and it goes through not just this process in detail, but also the next part of our lesson. It takes a bit longer, though, so I won't describe it to you. Now, if you have a conductor, by definition, the electrons inside are able to move around. And this has an interesting consequence when we consider what happens to the electric field. 
You see, if you have an electric field inside a conductor, well, it's just about impossible. Because any time you have that, you have charges in there, and the electric field that exists will cause them to move. So this will keep on moving and moving and moving and moving, and it will only stop once there is no electric field on the inside. You see, on the inside of the material, there is no way you can have an electric field in any direction without causing charges to move. There is, however, one place you can have an electric field. It's on the surface. But again, in that place, it's actually quite constrained too. So if you imagine all these electrons together, they each have helped set up a nice big electric field that's going to affect this guy right here. Now, if they were overall pushing slightly around this way, well, it would move that way, or around that way, it would move down the way. Over here, it would move over there. In the way, it would move in the way. They can only push this electron in one direction, and that's the direction that it can't go, exactly perpendicular to the surface. You see, if you push away from the material, it might like to go that way, but it can't because it can't travel through the air. This works for negative charging, this works for positive charging, and it works for solid conductors as well as hollow ones. We can demonstrate this um, in a physics lab quite easily. You take a Van de Graaff generator and you have an insulating cup or bucket. In there you pour something like maybe polystyrene beads or the video clip I found on YouTube was with Rice Krispies. And when you charge it up, the charge accumulates on each of the Krispies in turn and then they repel each other. Because they're nice and light, they're relatively easy to throw away. So they, they fly away one by one by one, taking some of the charge with them. Now I don't have a video clip of the next result, you'll just have to trust me. <clears throat> um, if you do the same thing with a metal cup, the Krispies just stay put. It is not possible to charge them up because this effect prevents any charges moving around on the inside. You see, a metal container will always have the charges accumulate on the outside. The other thing to look at is if we have a set-up electric field, this case here has a pair of parallel plates, and you'll know from National 5 or higher that when you have that, the electric field on the inside is called a uniform electric field. That means each field line is parallel to each other and evenly spaced. If you place a conducting surface into that field, well, you get this effect shown in this diagram. The field lines cause any positive charge on the surface to move around. Now, the movement of a positive charge doesn't actually happen in practice here, only the electrons are free to move around, but mathematically, the process is equivalent and it's just easier to talk about that due to the convention of the field lines. So if I have the sphere here, normally I would have a positive and negative charge here. The field lines are going to cause the positives to move away from that position, or you can indeed think of it as the negatives here pushing the negatives away from there. In any case, you're going to distort the electric field close to the conductor. That's one of the effects that it has, because always the conductor will have no electric field on the inside. This is actually really quite handy for something called electrostatic shielding. If you had, if you didn't have this, you wouldn't be able to protect ourselves from electrostatic shocks. We're relatively robust, apart from in cases of lightning, but if you have something like a hoover going past a TV or a phone, it would actually be a real problem. You see, any time there are large currents, you end up with large electrostatic forces because you have the electric fields. And if you weren't able to protect from that, it would be a real problem. <clears throat> it turns out all you need to do is place a conducting box or sphere around anything you want to keep nice and safe. You might see this referenced in spy films and the like, where people carry their mobile phone inside a tinfoil crisp packet to block all of the phone signals from tracking them. This is a real effect and it genuinely works. It's quite easy to disable even quite sophisticated equipment just with a sheet of tinfoil. Um, it's also worth noting, life lesson, if you ever find yourself in a particularly scary thunderstorm, well, inside a car is a very safe place to be. You are slightly more likely to be struck by lightning, but the effects are, for you at least, not going to be very serious. Because the car is basically a steel box, the charges will all travel around the outside, leaving the occupants inside nice and safe. This is why buildings being struck by lightning or planes, which get struck all the time, really don't cause anything more than minor sort of frustrations. There was actually a magician in the early 2000s, David Blaine, you might know him. Um, he did a very famous stunt where he stood on a podium for 72 hours straight and he was being struck by multiple very large Tesla coils that were producing very, very, very bright sort of lightning bolts. It was a visually very impressive stunt, but to be honest, it only really worked because most people were ignorant of this effect. A lot of people thought it must be magic to survive the lightning, but he was wearing a metal vest and a metal helmet, and it basically meant that it wasn't much of an issue at all. The doctors actually were more concerned about the ultraviolet light hurting his eyesight than anything else. 
There are a few video links here. The first one shows a demonstration of Michael Faraday's ice pail experiment in the early 1900s. He demonstrated this effect with a literal ice pail, which is a big metal bucket. And also there is one for the, showing the shielding here. This is a Van de Graaff next to a little Benjamin Franklin figure with tinsel attached to the back of his head. And without the cage, the Van de Graaff causes the tinsel to stretch out, indicating he is receiving the electric field. If you put the mesh over the top, then the tinsel will sit down, but it will raise up out from the back of this mesh. This software here is a three-dimensional model of any charges you like. It's the more advanced version. I've chosen not to use it for this video, just because it can be quite hard to see what's going on if you're not using it yourself. Last of all, we have next week's homework. Just like anything else, take your time, compare it to the video, break it down. There are only a few things that you can do. You literally only have three equations. That plus a little bit of drawing and some vector work is all you're going to need. Thanks for listening.